Good morning, everybody. Very good. Welcome to day one of the OpenStack Summit. How was the keynote this morning? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a, as a positive. Um, Welcome to the Cisco Sponsored Room. Uh, my name is Gary Kevorkian. I'm part of the Cisco events team. I'll be your host, MC, and guide for our sponsored sessions today. Um, I'm not gonna take up a lot of time on stage because I know we wanna jump right to the substance. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I think everybody probably got their badge scanned when they came in. Um, if you should also have gotten a little card for our drawing at the end of the session. At the end, we're gonna be drawing for a Polaroid snap camera. Ooh, very good, okay, great. Um, now that everybody's engaged and involved, um, we'll pick up those cards at the end of the session. Uh, I'm gonna get going right now with saucing up the stack with Chris and Hart, and I'm gonna let them come up and do some quick introductions on their own, and um, away we go. Thanks, Gary. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Revere. I'm a cloud solutions architect with Cisco. Um, I joined recently via the acquisition of Piston Cloud Computing, so spent a bit of time there if people have heard of, familiar with Piston. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about saucing up your stack on Metapod. And I'm curious if this looks familiar to anyone. This, this is also a Metapod, yeah. It goes over very well in Japan. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, in a nutshell, what is, what is Cisco Metapod? It's a you know, private cloud based on OpenStack providing a public cloud experience in your data center delivered as a service you know, on your hardware, in a nutshell. Um, and we're gonna be out there throughout the entire life cycle to make sure that cloud works correctly for you. So what do I mean by that? We're gonna help design and architect it to make sure it meets your storage needs, your compute needs. Um, we're gonna do the installation completely remotely. That also includes 24 by seven monitoring um, with proactive alerts, problem mitigation, and some of the key differentiators we have are actually platform updates, including major revisions of OpenStack. So we provide those with zero downtime as well as proactive capacity planning. You know, first and foremost, what is it really providing? What users and developers want? Um, I have this, you know, one of my friends is a developer for Congress, and I asked him, you know, hey, Joel, how long does it take you to spin up a virtual machine? And he's like, well, I, su I submit a ticket, and then it goes in a queue, management approves it, and then about 42 days later, I get an email with my credentials to the VM. Um, so what we actually see is, you, know, you see this emergence of shadow IT where people now say, oh, I have this cool project, I'm gonna whip out my credit card, go to a public cloud, spin some stuff up. So what do the users and developers want? They want self-service, integration with existing tools, well-documented APIs, and they want speed, right? Speed and agility. So <laughs> we talk about um, DevOps in action which can mean a few things to different, different people. Um, but like, you know, you take all those logos of those stickers, and as we see applications being developed today with more agility, what we have is the applications being broken up into smaller components or services. Um, you have a continuous integration server that's automatically, you know, seeing the changes that are being made. It's automatically kicking off testing of those instances, um, reporting back results, and then actually when it comes to deploying the application, it could just be as simple as you know, changing a proxy server, um, switching something in DNS. And so the point of this is really that all these kind of workflows, um, all these tool sets are a perfect fit to run on top of a cloud platform like, like OpenStack. Um, while at the same time, what do administrators want, right? They want to you know, govern their users. They want to hook into integration with their existing security policies, authentication. Um, they want high available and they want reporting, right? Control, reliability, and visibility. And Metapod is providing all of these components. So some of the three major advantages um, is this performance. This is kind of a noisy neighbor situation. Um, but, you know, if you're running, you have control of your own private cloud, you don't have the risk of, you know, sharing a hypervisor with somebody else and someone starts to do some sort of high performance workload that could adversely affect your, your virtual machine. And you also get the benefit because it's running you know, in your data center on your hardware, if you have, you know, super fast SSDs with, you know, next generation CPU or memory, you're gonna get the benefit of that horsepower that you have on premises. Um, there's really no lock-in with our service. I mentioned it's, it's deliver as a service. Um, we have a 4.9 SLA for the entire stack. And if you're not happy with the service, there's nothing to really stop you from just taking those virtual machines, you know, out of that cloud and putting it into some other sort of cloud if you'd like. 
And lastly, because it's your data center, your own hardware, you have control of the physical security, right? Um, it's your physical security posture. It's sitting behind your firewall, et cetera. We actually have a number of customers who have deployed uh, Metapod in different countries where there wasn't a public cloud um, there, so they're able to kind of spin up their own private cloud in whatever countries they need to. So I usually like to pull, like, okay, everyone's familiar with OpenStack, but I usually like, you know, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of OpenStack? Just anyone? Complicated? Come on, keep going, don't be shy. Complexity. Complexity. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so I like to say, you know, th this, this is what OpenStack looks like, right? If you, you know, deploy it from upstream. Um, and the reality is it's, it's hard, right? It's difficult. Um, it's frustrating. Um, it drives a lot of people crazy. And I've, you know, I've, I've talked to people where it's, you know, how long, okay, I was playing around with OpenStack. How long did it take you to get it up and running? Four and a half months. And Chris, by the time I got it up and running, a new version came out because there's a six month release cycle. How do I upgrade to that new version? Uh, I can't find much support. I guess I just start from scratch with the new version, right? So I hear a lot of confirmation of that. <laughs> um, so that's where, you know, if you deploy it from upstream, lots of times it's not highly available out of the box. Um, it can be very difficult to upgrade. Um, and then if you're, you know, doing it yourself, you also probably need a separate test environment that you need to maintain so you can actually test your upgrades there. But what we found is really companies want the features of OpenStack without all this complexity, right? You guys want to focus on your business, whatever you're doing at the high, higher level, the application, the agility of your development, and not really focusing on this spider web mess down here, right? Um, and lastly, you know, we all know there's no 1-800 OpenStack when it comes to, when it comes to getting support. <laughs> so, you know, when we're talking about um, OpenStack, it, it's kind of nice because there's this, you know, many, many options. And, you know, you're all familiar with lots of these. Th this includes some of the newer modules. But essentially, I look at it as, you know, the ingredients for making your own cloud. So, you know, there's the compute module. Some of these are more mature than others. There's the dashboard, there's object storage, block storage, and they all have, you know, project names. Some of the newer ones even have like mascots, like this little, you know, bear with magic wands or something. Um, so you have all these different projects, and, and it's nice. Like if, if I look at them as like Lego or building blocks, right? So if I was to give like everyone in this room all these different building blocks, and you were to say, okay, let's go, let's go build that cloud, um, I'm quite sure that there'd be a lot of different clouds that would be built. Some people might, you know, say, hey, we need this specific functionality. Someone else says, hey, this is in production. I don't want to use something that, you know, just got delivered a couple of weeks ago. So everyone would kind of build these snowflakes, if you will. And then you have the risk of, you know, how many people are actually using these components? And how many, you know, how are these different versions interacting with each other? And so that's where, this is one of my favorite, favorite features of the OpenStack website, but they announced it in Tokyo, right, the Project Navigator. So this kind of shows the list of a bunch of the projects with their maturity. And we get this a lot when we're talking to, you know, prospects. People say, you know, I want Zakar, this, this messaging service component. Well, the maturity is a one out of eight. It's been around for two years, and it's used by a whopping 1% of the community. Um, if you're building a production cloud, do you really want to, you know, be part of that 1% using that module, right? There's potentially some risk there. Whereas if you look at something like Nova, you know, everyone's using it very mature, and it's been around since the dawn of OpenStack. So then we get into Metapod. I like to refer to this as kind of a curated OpenStack. And what this is, is this is the core components that we're using. Um, we're very, you know, like I mentioned, we have a 4.9 SLA. We have a lot of experience running thousands of hypervisors for many clients with these core components. So these will, you know, you'll notice it doesn't have some of the absolute latest ones, but we'd cut rather err on, you know, supporting something that's going to be production and robust. So that's kind of where our focus comes from, and that's how we can confidently offer a 4.9 SLA for the entire stack. So there's, there's lots of options when it comes to, okay, you know, maybe you've decided on OpenStack. What are a few of the different routes you can take? Well, we've already discussed, you know, a little bit do-it-yourself where it's gonna require, you're not really gonna have SLAs, it's gonna be built on the expertise of your team. Um, there's a few kind of famous cases where some large companies built this OpenStack cloud and then they lost all their engineers, they got poached by another company. Um, so now they're kind of left, how the heck do I support this cloud, right? How do I upgrade it, et cetera? 
um, you're likely going to need people you know, around the clock with a bit of OpenStack expertise. Um, another option is the OpenStack distro. So actually, um, as I mentioned earlier, I came from Piston Cloud Computing. And it was nice because we could work with all these different components in the OpenStack ecosystem. But one of the challenges that we had sometimes was a customer would have an outage. And they weren't exactly sure who to contact first. So they would say, oh, we think it's something with OpenStack. So they would open up a ticket with us. We would spend you know, hours looking in the ticket. And then our engineers say, oh, it actually looks like something with the you know, software-defined networking vendor. So we now have to maybe take that ticket, send it off to that vendor. They look into it. They say, oh, we think it's actually a misconfigura misconfiguration on the switch. So now you send that ticket back to the customer. The customer's like, hey, I opened this a couple of days ago. What's going on? So it can be a little more difficult to actually troubleshoot you know, root cause when an issue occurs. And I think that kind of leads us into this other, the strength of Metapod, where it's essentially, because it's being run as a service by Cisco, we can support the entire stack with a 4.9, with a 4.9 SLA. And so essentially the control plane that I'll get into is, is Cisco Kit, and we can offer a 4.9 SLA on that. So what does Metapod actually look like? Um, you saw the Pokemon version earlier. This is the Cisco version. Um, <laughs> So essentially, I, I like to refer to this as kind of the, the brains of Metapod, if you will. And so this is where we have the 4.9 SLA. This is uh, two, two Cisco ASRs, um, two Cisco Nexus switches. Um, everything's in HSRP. And when we have three UCS servers essentially running the core of the OpenStack services. And then it's really at the bottom down here. That up there is just the control plane. Um, then it's pretty much bring your own server, right? It doesn't matter what vendors out there um, HP, IBM, Dell, Cisco. Um, so you can you know, bring your own servers, and, we have a, and then you can choose what sort of storage that you like. We're very flexible in terms of storage. And this goes back to earlier when I was saying, we'll help make sure that you have the right storage in your environment. So we can support, you know, we hook into a wide array of different storage solutions, um, NFS, SolidFire, NetApp. Um, you can use ephemeral or Ceph storage. Um, and the nice thing about this, I've mentioned that's really you know, production robust, is that this configuration here scales upwards of 400 physical servers. Um, essentially, you just add more switches as you expand. So it's you know, very robust and a 4.9 SLA. So then kind of we talk about saucing up the stack. And I think this is something that um, we encounter quite a bit. And lots of times, you, you, know, you show people OpenStack. And especially when people are new to OpenStack, they start asking all these other questions, right? Can OpenStack do this? Can OpenStack do that? And the whole idea is that you know, OpenStack is providing these you know, open set of APIs that you can leverage up the stack, right? It's not necessarily native OpenStack functionality. Um, so I, I kind of look at it as how do you want to actually consume it? So we have you know, Metapod, that's our OpenStack, providing the APIs, the core compute network and storage. And I think what's nice about it is you can have a bunch of different use cases that all coexist in the same environment. So for example, I kind of consider it the DIY. You have your you know, developer who is just used to natively developing these you know, cloudy applications, if you will, who just wants to consume. OK. <laughs> who just wants to consume the APIs directly, right? And those people are great. And that's, that's probably one of the most efficient ways, is just sitting right on top of those APIs, spinning up virtual machines, um, using your existing configuration management tools, and pointing it, towards, pointing it towards these underlying APIs. But there's other things that can sit on top of that as well, such as you know, platform as a service. When you're looking at things like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Apprenda, which can actually help enable you to add additional functionality to your applications, whether that be making them more hybrid cloud ready, so you can have your application running in a private cloud the majority of the time. And if you need to scale, you can easily scale out to a public cloud. Um, or whether it's you know, picking up existing Java and .NET applications and allowing you to you know, more quickly move those in an OpenStack in a cloud environment. Um, so Pivotal Cloud Foundry is quite nice because you know, we've been in cases where you're talking with people and you're talking to like, this company and they have a developer who's been coding in whatever language for like 25 years. And you know, you're talking to their manager, and it's like, OK, I want to I wanna move this application on this cloudy platform. Well, our guys just don't have any expertise coding in the cloud. And so that's where I think Pivotal has a really nice story where you can essentially take that person. They actually go to a, a Pivotal Labs office. They have them set up all around the country. Um, they actually joint program, paired programming with a, you know, a pivot is what they call them. 
and they're actually doing paired programming. They show up at 8.30, they get this like gourmet chicken and waffles breakfast. They're only allowed to work 40 hours a week, and then they kind of rotate with the paired programming, so different people. And they'll do that for you know, four to six weeks. And they happen to be developing on this platform, Cloud Foundry, which is a perfect fit to run on top of OpenStack. And so now that person goes back into their company and they actually start building out the paired program. They start building out that you know, cultural shift within their own company and you know, spreading it. So now they're actually developing more you know, cloudy apps, if you will. And now they've become more relevant with developing these applications on a cloud platform instead of the legacy infrastructure they were using earlier. Um, there's a whole bunch of other use cases as well. You know, big data, there's things like VDI solutions. Um, some of the newer stuff that Cisco has is um, there's a project called Mantle, which is all based on open source with Mesos and Kubernetes, um, as well as Clicker, kind of a hybrid platform that can you know, control your applications through a bunch of different sorts of clouds. And actually to talk to you more about that is um, Hart, one of our OpenStack evangelists for the pivotal portion. So hello there, thank you, Chris. So hello there, my name's Hart Hoover. I've been at Cisco for, uh, since October. Before that, I was at Rackspace. I was doing um, operations for some internal services, both running on OpenStack and AWS. So I'm very happy to be here uh, talking to you about Cloud Foundry. Um, so first, let's talk about the different methods that Cloud Foundry is delivered to you. So Cloud Foundry is delivered in three different methods. So the first way is through their public offering, which is Pivotal Web Services. It runs on AWS. Uh, it just kind of works as a public cloud function. Uh, you log in to an app manager. You're able to deploy applications. You don't see any underlying infrastructure. There's also on-prem Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the middle one, which we'll talk about today. Uh, and finally, a Cloud Foundry open source version, similar to the OpenStack model, where there's an OpenStack DIY version, as well as a productized on-prem you know, version from a vendor. Some components of Pivotal Cloud Foundry include routing. So there is a router that will uh, set up routes of your application to specific containers underneath. Uh, there is some service discovery in there for keeping track of where all these services are running, uh, some scheduling to keep track of containers in the cluster. There's also some logging and metrics available. It'll stream logs directly to you. Uh, on, the, on the right side, you'll see services there. Those are uh, not necessarily part of Cloud Foundry, but exposed in Cloud Foundry. So those can be external services. Like, for example, if you're running a database service on the side or have access to a public database service, uh, you can expose that internal to Cloud Foundry. Same with big data or object storage. You can expose those as service brokers in Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry also runs on multiple underlying clouds, including Cisco Metapod or AWS or uh, DOI OpenStack or VMware. So let's look and see how Cisco uh, Metapod and Pivotal Cloud Foundry work together. Um, so I'm going to switch off the slides. Oh my gosh. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the ops manager. This is what your ops team will see when they're working with Cloud Foundry. Let me full screen this. Everyone see that okay? Zoom in a little bit. So uh, here we see Cloud Foundry is talking to an OpenStack cloud, which would be Cisco Metapod. Uh, it also has a service exposed, so this is an operations team for Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, making a Redis service available to applications for developers. And then this is the Pivotal Elastic Runtime stuff. So this is all the guts of uh, Cloud Foundry. So give that a second to load on our super awesome Wi-Fi. Uh, so you'll see um, all the components of Cloud Foundry here and they all have handy dandy IP addresses. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so y'all can see that. Um, it'll show you some stats on what's going on with all of those services. Not much, it's just running for us. Um, so this is tied directly to instances running on Metapod. So here you can see all the VMs with all these little IPs here cor corresponding directly to these 
uh, services in Cloud Foundry. So here's an auth service, uh, HA proxy load balancer, MySQL, etcd, and console service discovery things. Um, so those are all tied directly to VMs and Metapod, and there are a lot of them. And here's our IP for our ops manager. So that's what an ops person sees uh, with regards to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. For the developer, they're going to log into an apps manager. So when you log into an apps manager in Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you'll have access, depending on who you are, uh, to different spaces or different organizations, excuse me. Uh, so we're in the Metapod space, or I'm sorry, Metapod org. And under that, we have access to several spaces. So for example, we can break this out into development, production, or QA. Or these can be broken out into uh, different teams within a single organization. Um, and so I want to show you the sample app that we have running here. So this is running on uh, Pivotal Web Services, so the public version, as well as our private Metapod version. So this is running a couple of containers. We're going to add some, add some containers here. So I want to show this app running here. So our, our Metapod logos here represent the instances, and we're adding containers to those instances. So here you can see in the app view, you can see the different services that are exposed for this, for this app. And I'll zoom in again so you can see it better. You can also see environment variables exposed for the service. So we can have these, uh, when we start the service, we can pass in some environment variables. Very 12 factor. And it has a route to our, uh, to our application. And then streaming logs, right? So, ooh, error. Oh, well. Um, but you can see my requests here. So I'm actually going to scale this up. Hopefully the demo gods don't curse me. So, ah, sweet. So uh, Cloud Foundry went ahead and automatically scaled that up for me. And then I can start adding services. So again, all of this is running directly on Cisco Metapod. And then I get a log of events that I scaled the instances to six. And you can also, instead of scaling horizontally, you can also scale vertically by adding more memory or disk. Scale back down to four. And it's done. So that's all as far as a uh, Cloud Foundry demo. Um, thank you for coming. Chris and I will take questions now. <laughs> Be sure to stop by our booth, C11, for other giveaways. Uh, we'll do the camera, I guess, in a minute, or Gary's walking up here, maybe. Q&A first. Please approach the mic if you're going to ask a question. We've got Qs, they've got As. Come up to the mic. Yeah. Please just, uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on. yeah, we have to be able to hear you. <laughs> uh, I want to know that, is it possible to run the just the cost, custom uh, community version of the CF instead of the PCF on sure. the metaphor? So the question, uh, the question was, um, 
just to make sure I understand the question before I answer, even though I just answered. Uh, <laughs> Is, uh, if, is it okay to run the uh, open source Cloud Foundry on on open on Metapod or OpenStack? Yes, yeah, absolutely. As long as you can validate your uh, install of OpenStack against Cloud Foundry, you should be fine. Uh, and there's steps in the documentation on how to do that. Or, yeah. Are you currently supporting the Cloud Foundry Diego, or just the DEA? So uh, Cisco itself doesn't support Cloud Foundry. Uh, I mean, I'm, you, I'm well, the runtime environment for the droplets within the DEA. Have you do you only support the DEA, or have you started supporting Diego in place of DEA? Yeah, Diego, Diego as well. Do you you yeah. support both. What's the most current version they have. Is what we yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I was trying Sorry. to find out. If you're supporting most current version with the Diego. most current version is what we support. Yeah. Sorry. Can you get a new version? I want to hear support, I think. <laughs> I was just wondering, how do people handle uh, networking for this? Is it usually all done in one big flat layer two network, or is it segmented out? So, so that's a great question. There's, there's a few different options in terms of how we handle networking. Um, our installs are based on Neutron. Um, for the most part, there's a couple different options. Um, one of those is Cisco can completely manage the entire network, meaning the switches, the routers, and you essentially can create whatever sort of virtual networks you like and attach floating IPs to get further connectivity. So we can have, you know, list, actually if you pull the slide. Um, so actually we can have lists of, you know, different IP pools. So you might have one that's a, a corporate IP range. Another one could be public facing internet addresses. We have a few other models where a customer can control the layer three environment, so customers responsible for the routes, the routers, and then you can essentially, as you provision VMs, you can put them directly on your corporate network if you'd like. Um, but for the most part, all the routing that takes place is offloaded from the software into the ASRs. Did you want the architecture slide? Yeah, that's fine. That's it. Any other questions? Uh, I say your integrated uh, ironical. Uh, I don't know whether you implement uh, um, a talent uh, talent and network uh, isolation. Did you get uh, my idea? Multiple tenants. Do we support multiple tenants in Metaplot? Uh, I know um, ironical did don't uh, isolate uh, network. Uh, all the all the talent uh, share network. Uh, in, com in community and washing. So I don't know Cisco's, uh, whether Cisco implement uh, network isolation. So, uh, so what you do tip traditionally in our, our Neutron implementation is for each tenant, you spin up a router and a private network for that tenant. So it is completely isolated unless you create another router and tie together multiple networks. But by default, everything is completely isolated. I think we're over on time. We're okay. Or we're okay? We're not gonna, we're not gonna evict you You're yet. coming with the, yeah, with the hook. <laughs> so if there are any, any last questions? If not, we can I hang think, out yeah, right I out mean, there. Chris, so. Chris, and, Chris and Art can hang out and talk to you individually. Or, yeah. or you know, the, the our, uh, Cisco booth C11 opens for business tomorrow morning at uh, 1045. Hope, actually, hopefully you all stop by tonight at, during the booth crawl from 6 to 7.30. We've got some goodies going on there, too. Uh, <laughs> and with that said, we're going to, I know the cards are already starting to be collected. So, um, I'm going, oh, every, now, now everybody wants a pen. Okay. <laughs> Actually, if you guys can just pass them out to the aisles, that'll make everything real simple for us. All right. All right. Let's see, how are we doing? We're doing, we're doing more, more, more. Okay, okay as, they, as, as they leave, your odds go up, so. <laughs> I'll let you, one, I'm actually gonna let one of you guys pull the card, so. It's okay. Okay, do we have everybody's card? 
Nope. Oh. Got a hole missing a whole half of the room here. There we go. All right. Okay. Is that it? Everybody in? Oh, there's always one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Where's the camera? And Hart is going to pick the lucky winner, mix them up. <laughs> we can do that ourselves. <laughs> the winner is uh, Donna De Capic. Donna De Capic? I'm probably saying it wrong. D E C A P? Okay. Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, every. Yep. Thank you guys for coming. Again, come see us tonight during the booth crawl. Come see us starting. Huh? Oh. Um, and uh, starting tomorrow morning at the booth, C11. We'll see you there. We've got another session coming up on ACI in about 10 minutes. <laughs>